Hi everybody. Welcome to story time for grown-ups. Discussion time. Firstly, a sincere apology to anyone from Amsterdam. I am sorry. Van Helsing had a very wrong accent. That is not what a Dutch accent sounds like. Originally, I thought he was from Transylvania as well and had simply been working in Amsterdam, so I made his accent similar to Dracula's. And once I realized he was from Amsterdam, I'd already started and had to stick with it. I really hope that didn't ruin anyone's enjoyment of the novel. Now, this is possibly my favorite part of this channel because I love talking about the thematic elements of books, the historical influences on them, their historical importance, all that jazz. I first read Dracula on an airplane from New Zealand to California, and I devoured it in those 12 hours. This has been a really different experience, with time to reflect and relax and research between chapters. Most of my research has been in discussions with friends who study literature, and then sometimes spent just ruminating on thematic elements of the book. Overall, I enjoy the novel. It's a phenomenal work of horror, and an historic work of horror, both in that it has resulted in some fantastic pieces of art and media, and the ways in which it has informed vampire lore. So vampire lore comes originally uh, from various illnesses, mostly, uh, rabies being foremost in my experience. Um, there's actually a lot of research being done on vampire lore at University of Wisconsin-Madison by Thomas Love. Um, I don't actually know his last name, uh, but he is kind of the researcher on it, and I've had a couple of discussions with him about it. It's fascinating. In any case, rabies was very common because it causes an aversion to bright lights and harsh smells, um, such as garlic, sunlight. Um, it also causes hydrophobia. So hydrophobia results in like not ca crossing running water because you're afraid of water, aversion to holy water because you're averse to all water, and foaming at the mouth, which um, like, causes bleeding, so your, your skin dries and cracks because you're so dehydrated and so you have blood in this foam that comes out of your mouth, looks like you might have been drinking blood. Um, rabies also results in the ties to wolves. Plague and several other illnesses has also been tied to original vampire lore common to Slavic regions and South America. And these facts have all entered the North American cultural lexicon through, by most um, ways, Dracula itself. Pretty much any modern-day vampire story has to at least acknowledge the rules set forth in this novel, even if, like Twilight, they choose to approach them in an entirely different fashion. All in all, it's a very fun book to read. So, getting into the facts. First interesting fact about the book. It is an epistolary novel, which is written at the height of the genre's popularity. So an epistolary novel is any work written as a series of documents. Other examples are Frankenstein, Lolita, The Sorrows of Young Werther, which is, of course, like the first major romantic big R novel. In Dracula's case, we have a collection of diary entries, transcribed phonographs, letters, telegraphs, newspaper clippings, etc. This was not a groundbreaking decision by any means, but it is an interesting tack to take for horror. So there has been a modern resurgent of this type of writing, in fanfic especially, also in some mainstream fiction. Um, there have been a couple that have been instant messages, uh, and then of course Perks of Being a Wallflower, which is also written as a series of letters. Um, mostly you get fix written as a series of tweets, instant messages, texts, often online articles, clickbait blog posts. It seems to act to create a sense of widespread importance to the narrative, so, for example, I've seen it a lot in Captain America fic because it gives this interesting way to discuss the socio-political ramifications of Steve Rogers as a person, his actions, and the high-profile events that surround him and his friends. This is a very modern twist on the genre, as it's easy to see that this was not the purpose of the concept with books like Dracula. In this novel, even the public writings that are used seem to have no understanding of their own importance or the role that they play in the story's narrative. So this creates a more intimate reader-as-detective sort of feel. The fact that we're reading private letters 
also lends credibility to the story, which intensifies the horror. We are seeing things that weren't meant to be read. They weren't written to be believed. As there's no need to lie to your best friend or your diary, it kind of creates the sense of immediacy and realness that amplifies the fear. It's difficult to create the same sensation in a written format nowadays, because most modern epistolary stories involve documents that would have been originally public, blog posts, tweets, articles. The way in which we document our lives nowadays is very public, which is why the epistolary conceit is used now more to create a global than intimate feeling. Dracula's intent is more comparable in a modern context to the Blair Witch Project than a written epistolary work and had a similar terrifying feel. With regards to major themes, Dracula has some questionable elements. It assumes a lot about humanity, some of which has changed, and I think for the better, and some of which hasn't. You can easily find yourself nodding along to it and then suddenly thinking, why is that assumption being challenged supposed to be horrific? Why is it supposed to be disorienting? Why am I supposed to agree with X and not Y? It's a very interesting novel for questioning your assumptions. So the first major theme, Dracula, according to a literature PhD student who also studies disability theory that I was able to talk to, was possibly the initial and at very least the codifying instance of the mentally ill person as evil slash servant of evil trope. This is an awful trope. The fact that Renfield's mental illness is linked to this anti-holy, anti-god creature is just tremendously awful. This concept has large historical ramifications. It's incredibly common in modern day horror as well. Either people who are possessed are mentally ill, are considered mentally ill, or in such works as the movie Secret Window, are driven to terror due to their mental illness. This rote vilification creates actual problems for people who are mentally ill, both in that their illness that doesn't present this way can be written off, illness that does present this way can be taken as signs of evil rather than signs of ill health. On the other hand, one could say that the pinnacle of horrific moments in the novel, the mutual feeding between Mina and Dracula, would not have happened if Renfield had been allotted any sort of credibility. This pulls us into the next theme of Dracula, truth from the mouths of fools. Firstly, we have Renfield. Interestingly, it is at his most desperate and his most lucid that he is dismissed. In his final moments of clarity, when he is begging for his doctor to send him away to do what is necessary for his and their health, He's considered unsuitable to determine his own needs and understand his own position. His respectability and credibility have been denied due to his mental illness. This strikes a painfully true chord. Doctors dismissing their patients in both mental and physical health care fields is a major problem, and one that is not often discussed, though it is gaining notice. In Dracula, this is the primary cause of Mina's undoing, the falling apart of their plans, Renfield's destruction, and ultimately Morris's death. Even more fundamental to the narrative is the original dismissal of the beliefs and superstitions of the locals in Bistritz. Jonathan Harker, a foreigner, an Englishman, comes into this land that is theirs, this culture that is theirs, this place that they know better than anyone, and believes himself to be above them. This refusal to accept local knowledge pretty much kicks off the entire horror of the novel. In a modern reading, this narrative condemns colonialist and imperialistic ideology. As we read the story, we say, what a fool Jonathan is not to listen to the locals about their own culture, what a fool Seward is not to listen to Renfield about his own mind, and all of this can act as a condemnation of ableism and colonialism. As I said, though, this is a modern reading. The original intent of this device was probably more Shakespearean. The fool says the thing that is true because the reader is going to identify with the protagonist. As a contemporary reader, you would not think, why aren't you listening to? You'd think, 
of course you wouldn't listen to. And therein lies the horror. The horror of, this is exactly what I would do, and I would be in this same position. So while the intent was to draw forth terror by putting truth in the mouths of those you, the reader, would never believe, in a modern context we read how the keeping of these ableist colonialist values created the horror that they must now fight, or at least brought this horror to their lands. And that is one of my favorite things about this novel. So far as themes go, we cannot discuss Dracula without discussing purity. Goodness and purity stand in opposition to vampirism. Vampirism is a blight, an impurity, something that separates one from God and cleanliness and renders you unholy, capital U, unholy. There are some very strong ties here with sexuality. This is subtext because a sexual nature is often described with these same terms and the fall of Eve is tied to a sexual awakening, but is also heavily textual. Point one, textually. Vampiric women are described as voluptuous and wanton. Lucy herself, in undergoing the transformation, moves from pure and whole and precious to voluptuous and wanton and enthralling, sexualized terms all. It is the sexuality of these women that shows their evil nature. Again, this ties back to the biblical fall, woman's awareness of sexuality heralding the downfall of mankind. Point two on a textual sexualization of vampirism, Dracula, after feeding tremendously and making his way to England, becomes better looking, enthralling, compelling. Additionally, in the scene where he sends the three vampire ladies away from Jonathan Harker, it's not because they're ruining his plan, but because Jonathan is his, in a way that reads very strongly of predatory homosexuality. Thus, especially for the time period, creating an unnatural sexualization of Dracula. It's important to note that this is a horror novel, written to scare, not titillate. This description should cause recoiling revulsion in readers as it does the characters. It's not that vampires are being sexual that's vilified, but sexuality is itself the thing that causes revulsion. Again and again in the novel, we see that innocence and purity draws you in, and sexuality and wantonness pushes you away. This is a predominant theme, and at times is very difficult to read. So now, related to both the previous thematic elements, and an element separate unto herself, Mina Harker. First and foremost, Mina is better than all y'all. She is better than me, she is better than anyone in this novel, and she deserves better. Textually, she's better than everyone because of her incredible sweetness and purity, but that isn't what I'm alluding to. Mina is incredibly intelligent. She puts patterns together brilliantly and is good in a way that has nothing to do with purity and everything to do with compassion and determination. She's trusting in a way that isn't naive, but rather open and willing to learn and listen and cooperate. The compassion and kindness she shows are textually feminized traits, and ones that kind of indicate weakness to the men of her company, but they are also shown to be necessary to maintaining humanity. This is vastly apparent in her ability to maintain such control over herself, even in the final days when she's called forth by the vampiric women. It doesn't allude to her purity, but to her compassion and her strength that she maintains her own being in the face of these troubles. The beauty of her soul was never in question. In the context of the novel, it is why she's targeted by Dracula, the corrupting influence attacks the purity of the soul, and also why the men flock to her, which is done in a protective and coddling fashion. She gets treated almost as a child when she very much isn't one. This conflation of compassion with innocence does a great disservice both to Mina and to the narrative itself. Due to the inseparability of these concepts, when the men wish to think of her as good, they must also think of her as innocent, untarnishable, naive, and this conflation causes them to question her ability to cope. She, who comforted her sick best friend, 
lived through said friend's death, lived with the uncertainty of her betrothed's life, nursed her husband back to health, who read all the atrocities that these men had witnessed, not only read, but studied, revised, transcribed these atrocities that they might be well documented and navigable. The men deem her unfit to remain in the know because of her feminine nature, and she bears that because she must, though the not knowing is painful, and considering that she is responsible for a large portion of their discovery of patterns and understanding of what must be done, her sequestration is quite possibly, ultimately, at least partially the cause for her greatest suffering. And now, the final element to discuss today, the ultimate demonic moment, the greatest horror of Mina's life. Interestingly, it is not the mutual drinking of blood between her and Dracula. I say mutual only because they both imbibed, but it was in point of fact entirely unmutual, as Mina had no agency in the matter. This is something Mina seems to be capable of enduring without breaking. She's horrified and faints, who wouldn't, honestly, but she regains her bearings and returns to the task at hand. Her greatest horror comes immediately on its heels when the wafer of the Holy Communion burns her flesh. The concept of being physically marred by that which is meant to spiritually purify is ghastly, and while she bears it with utmost grace, after a reasonable reaction time, in my opinion, it is this moment that she will truly never forget. How many times did the men who so loved her flinch after glancing at her forehead? And what is the flinching of these men compared to the turning away of God? An act that was not born in her, one that she reviled, one that was in fact done to her, has all the same caused her to be unclean in the eyes of God. This, alongside the sexualization of vampires, makes the rape analogy impossible to miss. To me, personally, it is this turning away that is the truly demonic act. There is not, in this situation, even the pretense of culpability on Mina. To anyone with a modicum of faith, the concept that something done to you, or something you are, could revile you to God is unbearably painful. It's no wonder she asks for the mercy of death, but even that is denied her. Not because she deserves to live, or because death would be a waste of her life, no. All agree with her that death would be the best course. But unfortunately, this thing that was forced upon her, that has removed her ability to be a person whole and pure, because these are one and the same, has denied her even the bare comfort of the afterlife. Her soul is forfeit to the vampire, unless he be remanded to God. This, to me, is the horror of Dracula. The fear not of the unknown, but of the uncontrollable. This concept of purity as both uncontrollable and necessary for your own salvation was not born from this novel. It is, in fact, a large part of several doctrines stemming from Calvinism. But it is very well employed by the novel. It is the playground of horror to grasp the most disturbing aspects of mankind and add just enough of the impossible. Vampires, after all, don't exist to look from the outside in. I chose this novel in part because we were going into Halloween month and it would be sacrilege not to pick one of the greats, and in part because the nature of horror is fascinating. That which we fear is often something that belies our assumptions about the universe, questions our norms, pulls us out of the comfortable. It's something that makes us look at least somewhat into the abyss and say, is something of me in that? Is something of that in me, and how do I escape it? I hope you enjoyed the novel, and for the next week I'm planning on doing some Edgar Allan Poe short stories, and then my next big project is Paradise Lost, which is 
beautiful, and I am working on my voices.